In machine learning, there's often a lot of talk oriented around different types of algorithms, how they're structured, and how performative they can be. What's often less talked about is how certain are we of the learned model parameters as well as the predicted output. One possible approach to estimate these uncertainties is the bootstrap method. In this, in this video, I will introduce this concept and then work through a simple example in Python to illustrate how we can actually use the bootstrap method on a real machine learning problem. So let's get started. The bootstrap method was developed back in 1979 by Bradley Efren. So this is a technique that has been around for the last few decades. And specifically, the type of bootstrap method we will consider here is non-parametric. So this is a Monte Carlo technique that we will be employing to generate our uncertainties. Now the essence of using the bootstrap method is that we want to generate a series of simulated samples from the data that we have available. So the, the reasoning behind this is that we want to get uh, an accurate feel for what the sampling distribution is for any given process that we're attempting to model. And the way that we're going to do this is we are going to repeatedly sample with replacement from the available data to construct each one of our bootstrap samples. Um, in the next part of this video, I will use a simple toy example to illustrate what we mean by sampling with replacement. So once we have all our bootstrap samples, uh, we can take our model and fit it and then test it on each sample. So we can generate a, a whole pool of results and we can then aggregate all the values that we calculate in order to calculate interesting statistics uh, that we are, we are looking for. Now two key assumptions that go into using the bootstrap method are listed here. Uh, the first one is that the available data that we use to build all our bootstrap samples should be an accurate representation of the true population of the data. And this makes sense since this forms the whole basis of all the bootstrap samples that we're going to be using here. Uh, we have to be certain that the data that we collect accurately represents whatever we are trying to, to model. The second assumption here is that the variance of the true population is finite, and that just ensures that we are able to calculate meaningful statistics on the, uh, the process that we are analyzing. So now we can go through the simple toy example. And so what we're going to do here is we are going to make use of this uh, simple data set and so here you can see it labeled as the original sample and this just comprises five data points. Each data point here is indicated by an animal so we have a rabbit, a cow, a pig, a turkey, and a monkey. And now what we want to do with this data set is we want to construct a series of bootstrap samples. So the way that we're going to do this is by sampling with replacement. So let's construct our first bootstrap sample. And here you can see that we have uh, extracted out a monkey, two turkeys, and two cows. Now the first thing that you may notice here is that we have duplicates, whereas in the original sample we do not. Now this is a consequence of sampling with replacement. When we sample with replacement, this means that each time we select out a, a data sample from the original data, that same data point isn't removed from the pool of data points that we can sample on at the next iteration. Instead, it is still available to be selected again. So now it is possible that you can have duplicate data points inside your bootstrap sample. If we construct another bootstrap sample, you'll see 
we will get now a different distribution. So now we have a monkey, a turkey, a rabbit, and two pigs. So this, again, just shows some of the variation that we can get from uh, taking on this procedure. And finally, we can construct a third bootstrap sample. And here we see we have a different combination of, of animals. So this is a fairly simple example, uh, but it's quite illustrative of how bootstrap samples are generated using, um, using this simple uh, selection with replacement technique. So now we can take this methodology and now apply it to a more realistic problem. So the next part of this video, we will jump into a Jupyter Notebook and actually try to use the bootstrap method to analyze a linear regression problem. Okay, we can begin here by running our first cell. This is just gonna load in all the packages that we need for the rest of the code that will come. The second cell will define the implementations of two different functions. So the first one is called make bootstraps. And this is the function that will produce our bootstrap samples. So the input data that we have is defined by the first argument, data. And the second argument, n bootstraps is an integer with a default value of 100 that sets how many bootstrap samples we will produce. The output has a form of a dictionary containing a dictionary. So what this is going to look like is that the outer dictionary is going to have keys called boot underscore n, where n will be the integer number of the bootstrap sample. Each one of these keys is going to refer to another dictionary that will have two different keys. Boot will refer to our bootstrap sample. Test will refer to our out of bag sample. So these are all the sample, these are all the data points that were not selected to be part of the bootstrap sample. And so this will form a very convenient test set for us. And so that's what um, this function is doing. One interesting thing to note is that we will also print out here the mean number of unique values in each bootstrap. And we will use this number in order, in order to check for the possibility of bias when training a model on these bootstraps. Uh, but we will look at this in a little bit more detail later. The second function is called prediction error by training size. And so this is the function that we're going to use in order to check and see how our linear regression model performs for different training set sizes. So the data will be input by the first two arguments, train and test. These two arrays will both contain all the predictor variables as well as our labels. Train sizes is a list. It's a list of integers and that is going to define all the different training set sizes we are going to want to try out. Iters is an integer and this will just specify how many times we're going to repeat our analysis for every single training size. The output will be a tuple of lists, and these two lists will contain the mean absolute error and mean squared error results. So we can go ahead and run this cell and define those two functions. And now we can go ahead and create our synthetic data set. So we're going to use the make regression function available from scikit-learn, and we are going to produce a data set consisting of 5,000 samples with one predictor feature and one target. I'm also specifying that I want the true coefficient value to be returned. And the data will also have some Gaussian noise introduced, and that noise is going to have a standard deviation of 5. And I'm also adding a y-intercept value of 1. So let's go ahead and run that and we can plot the data. And you can see that this looks pretty good. 
So now we can move ahead and look at how does training set size influence performance. So we can first do a train test split on our data and then define a list which specifies all the different training set sizes we want to try out. I'm just going to work through this. And now I will package up my training and test data. And so here I'm just combining both the predictor features as well as our labels together into the same array. So once this is completed, now we are ready to run our prediction error by training size function. So that runs quite quickly. And now we can plot our mean absolute error and mean squared error results. Okay, so this is what we get. The mean absolute error is indicated by the blue curve on the bottom. The orange curve shows us the root mean squared error. And you will notice that for smaller training set sizes, the errors are relatively large. And as the training set size increases, these errors tend to decrease and plateau out. This plateauing happens roughly around a training set size of 75. That is a training set that has 75 unique samples in it. And so we can conclude that as long as we have a training set with more than 75 unique samples, then we will not be introducing bias into our analysis. So this is a, a good number to keep in mind. So now let's proceed to generate our bootstrap samples so we can prepare our data and now run make bootstraps. And here we can see right away that the mean number of unique values in each bootstrap is more than 3,000. So this is well in excess of the 75 unique samples that we showed are required previously. And so based on this, we know that bias should not be a problem for this analysis. So this is a, a good thing to note. We can then move along and now actually make use of our bootstrap samples. So what I'm going to do in this next cell is I'm going to iterate through every single bootstrap sample. I will fit a linear regression model to this bootstrap sample. And then I'm going to store the model parameters that we get. Now if there's sufficient test set data, I will also test the trained model and obtain error metrics on the results. So I'm going to record the mean absolute error and mean squared error for these results. And we can pool these all together into these NumPy arrays. So let's run this cell. Okay, and now we can make some plots for all the different parameters that we've recorded. So the first thing that I'm going to look at is the regression coefficient. And here you can see its distribution over all the different bootstrap samples that were used. So now we can compute some statistics on these parameters. And here we see that the expected value is 16.82. We have an estimated standard error of 0.01. And I can also compute a confidence interval. So here what I've worked out is the 99% confidence interval for the regression coefficient. And this tells us that with 99% certainty, the true regression coefficient is going to lie somewhere between 16.63 and 16.98. So now we can compare this with the true value. We see that the true value is 16.82. So this is quite a good result. It actually matches our expected value and it falls nicely within our confidence interval. So this is quite nice. And we can repeat 
the same analysis for the regression intercept. So let's make a plot of how this parameter is distributed. And we can compute some statistics. So the expected value is 0.9. We have a standard error of 0 0.01. And I have a 99% confidence interval. The true value will be between 0.71 and 1.07. Now we know that the true value is 1. So it also lies within this confidence interval. So this is quite good. Now that's for the model parameters. We can also do the same exact thing, but now for the performance metrics. So that is the mean absolute error and the mean squared error, or in this case, the root mean squared error. So first we can make a plot of the mean absolute error. This is how it's distributed. Now we can compute the same statistics. So the expected value is 4.06. We have a very low standard error and a 99% confidence interval of 3.95 to 4.16. So this gives us a sense or a range for, for the kinds of performance that we can get with our model. Now I can do the same thing for the root mean squared error. So this is distribution and now some statistics. So the expected value is 5.1, standard error of 0.01, and a 99% confidence interval of 4.93 to 5.23. Now the last cell will just produce a plot that will superimpose our model. So the red line indicates the linear regression model using our expected parameters. So this is using the expected model coefficient and intercept. And that's superimposed on top of our data, which is shown as a scatter plot. And I also have included here two bounds. And that is just our expected linear regression model offset by two times the root mean squared error. And you can see that this bound encompasses where the bulk of our data lies. So you can see most of the, the majority of our data points falls nicely within this, this range or this zone. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you would like to take a closer look at this notebook, I have it available on my GitHub. I have a link included below where you can go to my GitHub repository and download this notebook along with others that I have, as well on my website, Inside Learning Machines. I have an article dedicated to the bootstrap method. I've linked that also below. Feel free to go to that article to learn more about the bootstrap method. And uh, I hope to see you in the next video.